Hey guys, welcome back. Surplus Restoration. Um, we got a lot in store for today's video. Uh, just a recap, um, I have set up my YouTube account finally, um, where we do restorations, obviously. Um, the previous video I did, um, we didn't get to do all of the restoration steps and all of that. Uh, as I said, I just set up my YouTube account. Um, I wasn't planning to really do a YouTube account, but seeing how my Instagram page took off, um, I've had a lot of people say you need to uh, do your own YouTube videos. And um, I've kind of taken a liking to that and um, it has been fun filming and I really have enjoyed just kind of documenting it. Uh, from the previous video, obviously, we did not get anywhere close to showing you all the full steps. And that's what we're just kind of gonna probably start doing here going forward with most of the guns that we end up doing, just depending on how long it takes and all that. But for this video and uh, the guns that I have coming forward, we will be doing that. Uh, quick shout out, Max uh, Van Cannon. He's kind of the guy that really gave me inspiration to go to YouTube and to show you all this. Um, I don't really plan on gathering too much of a follower base. Uh, this is just kind of a documentary thing and a hobby of mine I like doing. And if a few people can enjoy this, um, then, you know, why not? Um, it has been a lot of fun just restoring these. And I've, you know, just really enjoyed seeing before and after and just, you know, seeing uh, the full restoration processes and uh, the start to finish. So, um, yeah. So I do have my Instagram page where I show y'all um, all the guns I've worked on and restored. Um, Y'all have probably seen a bunch of those and I didn't do videos on those. And uh, the previous video, we did that VZ 12-33 and basically um, I was already about 50 to 75% of the way done with that. Um, and I just showed y'all how to do the barrel and the receiver, the bluing on that. And just kind of talking through the processes and uh, steps and directions on um, doing the bluing and um, stock work and all that. But going forward, as I said, um, I will be showing y'all everything start to finish on how to do these. So with that being said, uh, we've got three rifles on the table that I've uh, picked up today. Um, I previously did a poll um, showing y'all you know, the guns coming in and which ones y'all would like to see done first. Um, I had six coming in and I thought I had the P14 coming in today, but that hasn't been delivered yet. Um, so we've got three here today. Um, we're just going to kind of go over those. Um, and then the other three will be coming in later this week. Um, but just to start, I'll go over these three and what we got. Uh, first one we got here is the Arasaka Type 99. I got this one off Gunbroker. It is absolutely gorgeous. I think I got it at bid for eh, $400, I wanna say. I'm a little skeptical being how nice this gun is, especially the stock. Um, you know, just kind of questioning its originality if this is really, uh, truly the stock it came with. Um, I mean, the condition of this gun is excellent. The receiver, the barrel, um, all the parts look to be in amazing shape. Uh, everything looks to be matching. I mean, other than I said the stock, I can't really confirm that, but the um, the upper portion here uh, for the bayonet, that's matching. Um, the bolt isn't, um, but I just know that, you know, a lot of these Arasakas, just given that it was Japan in World War II, uh, a lot of these parts will not end up being matching. But um, this gun, I do not think we are gonna restore just given how good condition it is. Um, the lower portion here where the trigger guard is, is a little bit worn down. It could be reblued, but I just think I might just hold on to this one. I really like the way it is. Um, and I don't know if I'll end up selling it or not. Um, probably just end up holding on to it. I've had an air sucker before. I never got to shoot it. So might just hold on to it for a while. Um, just add to my personal collection. As I said, a lot of these guns I restore and then I end up selling them. I don't like to, um, uh, you know, become, you know, personally attached to these, you know, because once you start doing that, then it's hard to sell them. But for this one, I'll probably end up holding on to it, if not trying to sell it. We'll see. 
Um, it has that full mum on there, which I think is kind of rare. Um, I know a lot of these, they ended up grounding them down. I've read there's the you know, main reason why is um, it's dishonor to the emperor or something. I don't quote me on that. Uh, there is a few marks on that mom. I'll show you all a better picture, uh, but mostly intact there, which is really nice. Uh, like a lot of the Arasakas, you can see, um, there are a few missing parts. Obviously, number one being the uh, bolt dust cover uh, that is missing the, um, I guess, they're the aerial sights. Um, those are missing. Um, the um, bipod here is missing and the cleaning rod but those aren't too hard to just go out and find online so I'll probably end up doing that uh, but yeah I just wanted to show you all this one as I said I don't think we're gonna be end up or end up doing anything to it um, if I do we'll obviously do a video on that but um, probably just gonna leave it as is so really really nice rifle glad I got another one in my collection the next gun uh, we picked up is this M91 Carcano Fusili, I think is the way they pronounce it. Um, this I got off Royal Trigger Imports, I think for about $200. Y'all go check that website out. They have a lot of surplus CNR firearms for sale at a pretty reasonable prices. Um, as I said, I like to buy up as many surplus guns as I can while the prices are still low. Obviously, um, prices have gone up on a lot of guns. I mean, Look at Mosin's, for example. I mean, what was it back in 10, 12 years ago, you could get those around $100, and now um, they're selling more than quadruple that. Um, I had a hex receiver Mosin made in 1925. I picked up at a gun show for $100, and I think it was around 1925 is when it was built, and it was in really good condition, and those are now selling mm, six, $700. So. Any of these guns that you can get at reasonable prices, you know, anything below $300, uh, especially, you know, I'm just, you know, hop on that. Anyway, so yeah, this is the M91 Carcano uh, Fusili, uh, made in Italy uh, during World War I. Um, I believe this was produced in 1917. Um, oh, yeah, forgot to mention as well. Um, I have not stripped these gun de guns down to really do a full dive into, uh, you know, uh, markings, uh, the year's bill, just making sure everything's matching. Y'all are seeing this as I have gotten it. So, um, yeah, really, really cool rifle. Um, very worn down, as you can see. Um, a lot of the bluing has gone. There's a good amount of surface rust. Um, stock has definitely seen better days. Um, this one will be a full restoration. Uh, we'll go over that in a bit. And the last gun that we have here is the M95 Steyr Man Liquor Carbine. Uh, this is an Austrian-Hungarian rifle from World War I, produced by Steyr. Uh, don't know the year built yet. Um, I need to do more research. I remember there's a way to date this, but I have not been able to date it yet. Once we take it down, we'll be able to kind of figure more of that out. Um, this is my first straight pull rifle. If y'all know what straight pull is, uh, different than bolt action. Basically, you just cock it back, push it forward, rather than actually having to cock it up, pull it back, and then cock it down again. So really, really cool design. I'm really happy I have finally gotten one of these. Uh, this is chambered in eight by 50. Um, I'll go in a little bit more depth into the historical uh, significance of that because a lot of these were converted over to 8x56. So I think this is kind of a rare variant that I've gotten, um, at least from what I've read that it is, you know, a lot harder to find uh, M95s in their original um, caliber, the 8x50R, than it is the 8x56. And I mean, we'll talk about it more, but um, if it was converted, there would be uh, a letter, a little prefix up here that would, if it was um, Steyr, it would say S, or if it was Hungarian, uh, it would have an H, I believe. Um, yeah, so this is going to be the main rifle we talk about in this video. Now we're going to move on to uh, the grading process 
which I've kind of come up with. Um, so yeah, going forward, we're going to be doing this with all the guns that I end up getting. Basically, just kind of giving a grade to the overall rifle, uh, the condition of the parts, um, and just looking at um, overall what we're going to be planning to do. But for now, we'll just kind of go over the grade. So we kind of have this broken up into sections. You can see on the left side of the screen. First we have is the barrel. And just to mention, we are going to be grading these out of 100. And it's just kind of a rough estimate of all the guns I've had before and seen just kind of the grade of, you know, how it is relative, you know, 100 being the best I've seen, zero being the worst. So anyways, sorry, the barrel. Uh, overall, I gave that about a 75. Uh, the rifling was pretty good. Uh, I gave that about an 80. Uh, but the bluing is the bad part of this. I haven't stripped this down yet to really see the full barrel, but just from the parts that I can see, I'm giving it about a 15. So overall grade, uh, about a 57 on the barrel. The receiver, um, no pitting, surprisingly, from the parts I can see up top. Um, it looks to be in pretty good condition. Uh, I gave the outside about a 75. The bore is in good condition, gave that about an 85. The inside of the receiver, uh, there is some a little bit of surface rust, uh, nothing too crazy, a little bit lower to 70. And then as you can see from the overall finish and the remaining bluing on there, not that good. Gave that about a 15 for an overall grade of about a 61. The bolt, let me take it out. The bolt, bolt head, uh, mm, not too bad. Uh, these weren't originally blued. Uh, to my knowledge, um, it is a little bit rougher. I gave that about a 55. The cocking piece is a little bit better. I gave that about a 75. The safety, uh, it's pretty good condition. I gave that about a 70. Uh, the firing pin, spring, and the firing pin, I did actually uh, take it down. Um, it, those are pretty good, around 80s for those. Uh, bolt body itself, uh, not so good. It's got some... Uh, uh, some surface rust, um, mm, nothing too bad. The actual bolt itself is good though, but overall grade about a 60 and the finish uh, about a 50. But as I said, these weren't really originally blued, but we are going to uh, be giving it that nice shiny finish that we like. Moving on to the lower, the trigger guard and magazine. Um, I gave the lower around a 70. Uh, the trigger is a little bit nicer, 75. Uh, the follower and the parts, um, pretty decent. Give that about 70. The clip latch parts, uh, those are pretty good, around a 75. And the bling is a little bit better than the receiver itself. But, I mean, as I said, we are probably, well, we are going to be removing that and sanding that down. But I gave it a 25. The stock, um, it's actually not too bad. There's not any crazy dings. In here, nothing, you know, you know, worse than you would see from a World War One rifle, but about what you would expect. I gave the stock overall grade about a 65. The handguard's pretty good condition. I gave that around a 70. Uh, butt stock, um, I give that a 70 as well. There is, I believe, this is where the serial number, if it was matching, this is where the serial number would go. But that's really, really worn down, and I can't tell. Um, but I gave the butt stock a 70. Uh, butt plate, um, uh, kind of what it follows with the receiver and the barrel. It's lost a lot of its bluing, but no crazy dings or um, pitting. I gave that around a 55, uh, so stock overall grade of around a 65. Uh, worth mentioning, there does seem to be a crack or a repair here. Uh, near the end of the receiver, um, so um, I don't know when that was done or um, what that is, but um, worth noting. So overall grades, we are giving the barrel a 57, the receiver a 61, the bolt a 68, the lower a 63, and the stock around a 65 for an overall grade of 63. Now we will be moving on to talking about um, just a general overview of what we are going to do 
in the restoration process. Okay, so you can see from the left side of the screen, this is uh, a general overview of the restoration plans. So this is kind of is an overview of what we are going to be doing um, to the restoration of this M95 Steyr. Uh, kind of broke it down. Um, we'll start with what we're gonna do with the barrel. Um, so yes, we will be sanding this down. And as I have previously mentioned, a lot of people uh, do not uh, support or say that you should be sanding the metal parts of a gun because it can remove um, some of these stampings and markings. And while yes, I agree uh, mostly with that, I have found that this is the best process to actually removing all of the excess bluing and rust along with the blue and rust remover. Um, there are other processes doing this as well, but they're, I found to be more expensive and um, I've just had good luck just doing the sanding in general, so I am sticking to that. I haven't had it to where I have removed any major markings or I have gotten rid of those. If there is a gun that I get and the markings are pretty worn down and I believe that the sanding would make it worse, yes, I will probably find another way of um, getting the bluing and the old bluing and the rust off. But for now, we will be sanding these down and it won't be too hard since this gun doesn't have much of its original bluing. So yeah, going back to the barrel, we will be sanding it down. We will be bluing it. We'll be doing uh, cold blue. And as I, going back, as I mentioned, I will be switching to rust bluing in the future. But for the guns that I have now, we're gonna be cold bluing those and as I said, I have found that, you know, cold bluing has worked pretty well for me on all of my guns. Uh, there are questions of longevity um, and how well um, it stays on there. And yes, I know that it will wear over time, but most of these guns, I am not planning to go crazy on shooting and transporting. They're more of just relic pieces and guns I intend to sell. And, um, you know, the overall, purpose of my channel is to show you um, the average shooter, the average gun owner, how you can restore firearms without blowing your wallet. You you know, there's hundreds of YouTube videos out there of guys who have all this crazy machinery and equipment and techniques to really fully restoring a gun. And while yes, I would love to do that and eventually have something like that, for now, I wanted to show you how the average person can buy all the supplies and stuff uh, to do this. Um, and um, I've had very good luck and it's been a lot of fun doing. So um, yeah, for longevity reasons, cold bluing is not the best option, but for now it has worked great for me um, and I've been very happy with the results. So going back, I'm sorry I get sidetracked here. The barrel, we will be doing about eight to 12 applications. And we'll go over the full process of that later. Receiver, same thing. We'll be sanding that down, um, uh, doing bluing as well. Uh, same thing about eight to 12 coats. The bolt, on the other hand, we're not going to be bluing at all. We'll be sanding it down and uh, polishing that up um, since it was, and at least to my knowledge, not originally blued. Uh, lower and the trigger guard magazine, same thing as the barrel and the receiver sanding and bluing, but probably less applications of the bluing. The stock, uh, we will be refinishing. We will be using wood stripper. Uh, two to three applications of that, we will see. We'll be sanding that as well, doing a pre-stain. Uh, the stain color, we're probably gonna be doing a mix of the Minwax, probably walnut and the gun stock finish uh, to pro mm, well, to see how much we can get it towards the original uh, condition of the stock. For the stock, we will be doing a uh, wood stripper, probably two to three applications of that. Uh, we will be standing that down um, and doing a pre-stain. Um, the stain color, uh, I'll be using probably walnut and, um, well, a mix of walnut and gun stock, the Minwax brand. Um, we'll see. I want to get as close as I can to the original stain that this gun had, so I'll probably do a little more research on that and testing. Um, I have a bunch of different um, stains so I can play around with those till I find you know which stain most accurately um, looks like the original 
uh, stain that these guns came with or these stocks had on them. Um, and we'll probably do one to two coats of those, just seeing, you know, we'll see after two, uh, maybe do one, we'll see. As I said, this is all trial and error. Um, if after one it looks good, we'll keep it. If we need to do more, we will. And then we'll do a protective finish on there just to finish it up. So that is the restoration plans, just a summary of that. Hey guys, sorry, I had to make a, an edit to this part of the video. Um, at this part, I was gonna show you the full restoration steps that we would be doing for this rifle and that I do for um, almost all the rifles that I've done. But since this is the first time I've really put a table like this and written everything down, there were some things that I had to change up uh, and mix around. So uh, you will be seeing the new table here in a second, but just quick overview. I've uh, put together kind of a table slash list of all the different steps and processes that go into the full restoration, um, just kind of from start to finish, and we'll be doing it for the Steyr M95. Um, I actually am in the middle of having it completely stripped down already, so there was really no point in bringing that out. So I have the VZ12-33, which we did in the previous video, just out here, but I'll pretty much be having that table up on the screen for the remainder of this. Um, so as you can see, um, we have it kind of listed out in subsections, uh, starting with A, which is obviously disassembly. Uh, obviously, first thing you do is you fully disassemble the rifle, pull in the parts, check for anything that might be broken. Um, and then what I like to do is just organize all the parts based on the restoration process. So, you know, putting the screws together in one piece and then kind of smaller to bigger pieces in another pile and, you know, setting aside the stock and whatnot and making sure that you have either plastic bags or some kind of containers to keep the smaller parts in. You don't want to lose anything. I've done that before. I'm sure some of y'all have, uh, have well. So um, just making sure everything's nice and organized. Uh, next step I kind of go to is the cleaning and degreasing. You would do this if you weren't restoring too. That's usually one of the first things you would do is, you know, cleaning and uh, getting off any of the surface dirt, grime, gum powder that might be on there. Um, I use bore cleaner with a bristle brush. Uh, that seems to really work good. And then once that's done, I kind of wipe it clean with some goof off. You don't have to do it, but I like to. It gives it that nice uh, dry finish. And uh, when we get to the actual uh, sanding and bluing parts, we I like to use a degreaser uh, just to get anything that might be left over off. I use a mixture of crud cutter, goof off, and just a regular hand soap with water. Uh, you'll be seeing that later on as well, of course. Um, and then when it comes to the actual parts, I like to start uh, from the smallest parts to, up to the biggest parts. So um, I find that easiest. Just go ahead and get the smallest stuff out of the way. Um, these are all kind of kind of be the same. So I start with sanding down all the screws and smaller parts, um, using uh, blue and rust remover for any parts that I was unable to get the bluing off. And I've probably mentioned in this video the sanding for the millionth time that a lot of people are against it. They advise it against it, especially when it comes to the markings on the gun, like the receiver or any manufacturer marks, stuff like that. And I agree for the most part. But if, um, I mean, in the past, I have not had any trouble with that or had it wear down on me at all. It's all come out fairly well. And it allows me to get almost all of the excess or previous bluing that was on there and rust off. Um, if there, the marking on there was um, pretty worn down uh, prior to the sanding, I would be cautious about doing that. But, you know, once I run into that issue, we'll, you know, go from there. But yeah, you sand down all the parts, use the blue and rust remover for anything you are unable to remove bluing with. And if you do use the blue and rust remover, uh, I like to sand it down again with some finer stuff like a thousand or two thousand because the blue and rust remover can leave a little bit of a film on there. And then once you're done, just you know clean and degrease again. Uh, bolt is a very similar process. Um, I like to you know sand it down, and I will do all the steps for the sanding later. But you know sand it all the way down. Uh, blue and blue and rust remover all the parts. Um, and then sand down again. Um, and then I end up using uh, some zero grade steel wool to give it a nice shiny finish. And then finally doing a metal polisher. Um, and since we will not be bluing this bolt for the Steyr M95, um, we, I like to use that metal polisher to just give that nice 
final shiny finish like we did here with the VZ 12-33. I don't know how well you can see it. I'll probably end up throwing some pictures on here, but it came out really nice and shiny. I'll, yeah, you know, I'll throw a before and after on here so y'all can see. Sorry, I actually end up missing a step there. Uh, after the screws and small parts, you go to the bigger parts, such as the butt plate, barrel bands, swivels, rear sights, blowers, etc. Uh, do the same exact thing you did with the smaller parts. Um, you can actually steel wool some of the bigger parts if you want to. Uh, I don't find it completely necessary, but sometimes you can notice a, a, a little bit of a difference. Um, but yeah, kind of same thing we do with the screws and the small parts. And then we go on next to the barrel and the receiver. Uh, pretty similar to the bigger parts in the screws. You sand down all the way, blue and rust remover, uh, sand down again with some finer stuff, 1,000, 2,000 grit, and then finish it off with some zero grade steel wool. And this is optional. Uh, for this gun, I didn't do it, but I've done it in the past where I will tape up the barrel. That way I can just blue the receiver. But if you uh, sand down both the receiver and the barrel and you just blue the, bar or the receiver and not the barrel altogether, you can have a little bit of bluing seep in there and you will need to sand down again. I found at least, I mean, you know, people say don't do it, but I like to blue everything at once, like you saw in the previous video, and it comes out fine. They just say don't, you don't wanna leave it on there for more than a minute. Uh, I found that that is not much of an issue. I really don't know where that comes from. I'm not a chemist, like I've said before, um, but it's always seemed to work out fine, as you can see with this VZ and almost all of my other guns. The only gun that I did tape down for, I believe, was the uh, Carcano Cavalry Carbine, and I had to go and resand the barrel again before bluing that. And then you have to worry about excess bluing get back on the receiver that you just finished. So it's easier for me just to do it all in one piece. Uh, once you're done with that, yeah, obviously the bluing, um, kind of like before with the sanding, you start with the smaller parts. So I start with the screws and anything small like that. Uh, Degrease and clean again, just to make sure it's, it's all cleaned. Um, and then you kind of put them all together, you heat them all up. Uh, I use a hairdryer. Um, there are other ways you can heat them up. I haven't really done much research, but hairdryer seems to work easiest for me. Um, if there's a lot of screws, um, sometimes I'll do them in sections. Uh, you know, I like trying to do everything at once, but it's, since it's such a tedious process, I try and do it all together. Uh, just the only issue with the screws is things getting blown around with the hairdryer. Um, but you know, I, I'll find a remedy to that. Um, so once you heat them up, you apply an even coat of super blue. Now I talked in my previous video, but I like to do super blue applications first. And what I found with super blue at least is that it seems to get an even coat throughout all the, the parts, um, quicker, well, not quicker, but more evenly than starting out with perma blue. So it's like a good initial coat and it depends with the smaller parts. I don't do as many applications. I do about two to four, but once I notice that the super blue isn't doing it anymore, uh, isn't darkening the parts anymore, that's when I switch to perma blue. And I found at least that the perma blue seems to give it that nice darker uh, coat that we like. I don't know why that is. I don't know if I should just be doing perma blue alone. When I've done perma blue alone, sometimes it doesn't uh, get everything evenly. The super blue seems to do that first and then the perma blue gives it that nice dark color. Uh, so after doing the two to four applications of the super blue, obviously you rinse cold with water and you steel wool to remove any of the excess bluing splotches. Um, sometimes you'll see them on there. It's that kind of colored or discoloration. Um, you won't really notice it much on the smaller parts like the screws. I usually don't end up steel wooling. I just keep going with the applications. But once you move on to the bigger parts, you will want to use that steel wool. Um, and then you're, you're going to want to repeat those steps um, for the perma blue, uh, but doing the same thing. Uh, for the small parts, I do about two to four applications. For the bigger, I do around four to eight. Just kind of doing it until you really can't notice much of a difference. People say that around four is when, you know, that's about as dark as you're going to get. It's not going to get any darker. That's, I found that to be most of the case. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't but there's no um, harm in trying. Uh, and then, yeah, once you're done with that, I like to lubricate all the parts, give it a nice heavy lubrication to it. That's when you will see that the parts actually get darker. It's, the oil seems to really bring it that, that dark color out that we like. 
Um, and since we're not reassembling, you can just really fully put a heavy coat of lubrication on there. Next is the stock. Um, I haven't done a video yet on doing the stock alone, but we will be doing this with the Steyr. Uh, it's, it varies from gun to gun the way you wanna do this, but this is just a general way that I've done this with the guns I've restored so far. Uh, first, it, you know, since you haven't really cleaned the stock yet, I like to just degrease and wipe any of the excess dirt and debris away from the surface, maybe just using some steel wool um, and, you know, just a little bit of crud cutter, just wiping that away. And then you move on to the wood stripper, which is going to do most of the work of getting the previous stain out. Uh, apply it evenly throughout the entire stock and you let it sit there for about two to three hours or longer depending on the condition of the stock. Once you're done with that, you want to scrape away all the excess and you want to wear gloves for this. The wood stripper that I use, at least if you get that on your skin, it's going to burn you. You have to be really careful with that and you want to make sure you scrape it all off and wipe it all off. And you can get all of that excess stuff away in the next step where it's, you know you do grease and you use steel wool under some hot water to really make sure you get all of that wood stripper out. And once you're done with that, you want to let that dry. Uh, you can let it sit overnight if you want. Uh, most of the time, just depending on how I am with the time rush, I'll just end up using a hair dryer, uh, which seems to work fine. And then after that, we move on to the sanding portion. Uh, I like to start with 120 grit and then moving to 220, 400, and then 800 for a nice smooth finish. You can go higher if you want, but I found that 800 gets it nice and smooth. This VZ 12-33 is very smooth. It came out really, really well. And then you can repeat those steps 32 through 36 again if needed. Well, not through, you don't need to sand down again, but the wood stripper I found doesn't, sometimes doesn't get it on the first try. It seems to work best if you, after doing the wood stripper and degreasing, it seems to open up, I guess they're called the pores in the gun itself or the stock. And once you do the wood stripper again, it can seep down in there deeper and really allow it to penetrate and get that excess uh, previous stain out of there. So I usually do two wood strippers, just depending on how the first one comes out. If the first one does it, that's fine. Um, but yeah, step 36, if you notice that the wood stripper really didn't do much, do it again and then move on to sanding. I should probably uh, interchange those steps there. But yeah, once the sanding is done, you want to make sure that all the excess dust and uh, stuff is wiped off, make it as clean as you can, dry as possible, and that's when you're going to apply the pre-stain, which prevents uh, streaks and blotches and allows it to, uh, the stain to pretty much get in there nice and evenly. And then you want to apply your desired finish. Um, I am going to probably be using a mixture of walnut and gun stock uh, finish. I think it's Minwax, I believe, that'll be doing. I want to best replicate the finish that the stock originally had when it was produced. Uh, I've, sometimes I haven't done that with my previous stocks uh, on the guns, um, but if I find that there have been versions of the gun that had uh, a certain color that I liked, I'll go after that color, even if it wasn't the original color that the stock came out with with that particular gun. Um, and then, well, it depends, but usually one coat seems to do it. If not, I'll recoat it and uh, let that dry. You wanna allow about an hour between coats. And then you wanna let that sit for about 24 hours before you apply your protective finish. I use a polycrylic clear finish. And once you're done with that, you let that dry and your stock's pretty much done. Moving on, we have the bore and barrel polish. I have not talked about this in that previous video or before on my Instagram page. And I promised I would, so we're just gonna go ahead and go over this. Basically, this is the best way of restoring and cleaning the barrel as best as you can with these older firearms. Uh, so starting out, I like to use a bristle bore brush and a cleaning rod to remove the heavier gunpowder residue that's in the barrel. Just go ahead and get so much of the excess off as you can. And then you get your cleaning rod and attach a clean patch to that and use gun bore cleaner. You wanna run it through a, a few amount of times. I find that the first time you go through, you're gonna have a lot of uh, excess gunpowder on there. So you wanna keep replacing uh, patches and redoing the gun bore until you notice that the patch that you're using isn't coming out super dirty until it just comes out. It, it, it'll keep coming out dirty most of the time, but just until you start to notice a real difference that it's, it's not really pulling any of the um, excess gunpowder out of there. 
And then once you're done with that, uh, you wanna just make sure the barrel and bore are nice and dry. Just run a, um, a nice dry patch through there a few times. Um, and then this is where we go to the actual polishing. If you're a big user of YouTube, you probably know the user Iraq Veteran 8888. He does a lot of historical firearms and stuff of that nature. And in his earlier videos, he would do uh, restoration type stuff. And he did a video on a Mosin the Gaunt where he polished the barrel and the bore with this stuff right here called JB Bore Bright. I'll throw up a better picture on there. This really helps to polish up um, any of the old type surplus gun barrels and the bore. Um, I've used it on all my guns and it has worked great. Basically what you do is for the bore is you attach a bore mop that fits relatively snug in the bore uh, to your cleaning rod. And then what I do is I attach that cleaning rod to a drill. And basically what we do is we, if I can do this with this VC here, sorry, I couldn't find my uh, bore mop and cleaning rod kit, but this is just gonna be a representation. Obviously you would use a bigger bore mop because this one, you know, does not fit snug into the bore. But basically you would use your JB Bore Bright, apply it evenly onto your bore mop. You go into the bore and you would do kind of a back and forth motion. Well, you would have this attached to the drill and you put the drill on a kind of a relatively low setting and just going back and forth. I like to do about 40 to 60 full strokes in there, just making sure that you're doing it all evenly inside there, getting as much as you can. It does get really messy, so it's obviously nice to have the gun fully disassembled. Um, and then once you're done with that, you want to clean all that excess bore bright polish away. So I just end up, you know, using a cleaning patch and maybe even attaching a cleaning patch to a bristle brush and getting in there with some gun bore cleaner, trying to get all the excess out. It's okay if you don't get it all out of, all at once because you're gonna be doing the barrel next. In the barrel, you would do the same thing. This is kind of a good representation of the bore mop you would use. And this fits pretty relatively snug in there. And you would do a similar thing, just going in and out of the barrel, about 40, 60 strokes. Um, and this really polishes up that um, the rifling and the bore really, really well. I found this stuff to work absolutely great. It makes a huge difference. We'll obviously do a before and after of this, and I will be showing you all the process once we get to it. And then once you're done with the bore bright polish, you wanna repeat the steps 44 to 47, like you were gonna uh, clean it again if it was like still dirty. Uh, same thing, use a bristle brush, get in there, remove any of the excess uh, bore bright, and then get in there with some patches with some uh, gun bore cleaner, run it in there. This stuff's purple and it's, it, it usually turns black because you're getting, you're polishing it up. You just wanna keep going in there until it's not coming out black. It'll take, I mean, it'll probably be 10 to 12 uh, strokes in there or different patches until it really starts coming out somewhat clean. If it doesn't come out all the way clean, it's fine. Usually there's a lot of heavy residue in these, especially these older firearms, but just to the best you know that you can until it comes out somewhat clean. Um, and then once you're done with that, I like to attach a patch to the cleaning rod and use uh, some lubricant. I run it through about once, maybe twice, depends. Um, if it still comes out dirty, I go back and do, I do the gun bore again, but you want that lubricant to come out somewhat clean. And once it does, you, I like to, run one clean patch through there just to make sure I get any of the excess lubricant out of there. And same thing with the bore, but you can probably get it if you're just doing the barrel as well, just making sure to go all the way through and into the bore. So yeah, that's that for uh, the bore and barrel polish. We will be doing that later on. That's one of the last steps. But the final step obviously is the reassembly. Um, now, previously we had lubricated down all of our metal parts uh, we had a heavy um, application of lubricant on there. I like to wipe that lubricant off and then replace with a thin coat of lubricant before uh, reassembling it. Obviously, you want to have all your parts organized when you reassemble. It makes it a lot easier. And then, yeah, just reassemble the rifle and you are done. Uh, that's the way I did it with this VZ. Um, I don't think I did it in that exact order, but now that I have everything organized, this is the best way that I figured out we will be doing the Steyr M95. I'm sorry, it's such a long uh, talking point. Um, a lot of y'all have requested I, um, I post just kind of the full restoration steps. So that's what I wanted to do. And for y'all to either, you know, take a screenshot or have this to go back on if you're planning to do um, a gun like this. But obviously we will be doing all of these steps and I'll be having uh, 
the video chunked out to where you can skip forward to each uh, subsection of this restoration process. So um, anyways, yeah, I guess I've already done this part, but we will be moving on to the cleaning and degreasing next. So I will see y'all over there. All right, guys, well, I have all of my tools and everything that we need to go ahead and get this rifle dis disassembled. Uh, as I said, um, I try and, and just wing the disassemblies. I'm sure I'll, you know, many of you end up looking at YouTube if you can't you know, figure stuff out. I probably will end up doing that, especially when it comes to the bolt. I've looked up a video on how to do it, but I've totally forgotten. So there's probably gonna be some parts that I clip out or fast forward. Uh, so you'll probably see me struggling a bit during some of this, but um, we will go ahead and try our best to get this disassembled. Um, hopefully it doesn't take too long. And as I said, any of the markings I find on here that might help indicate production dates and stuff like that, we can go over that. Um, so yeah, let's see, where to start? Usually I like to start with uh, barrel bands and stuff of that nature. These screws look pretty good, so um, I'll probably be fast forwarding a bunch of this, so just enjoy, I guess, and enjoy watching me struggle with some of this. All right, now that we have the gun completely disassembled, I will show you all some pictures of what it looks like, um, just some of the parts that are, or portions of the gun that have a lot of wear to them or build up of grime, dirt, all that stuff. Um, it's about what you would expect probably from a gun that's never been taken apart or probably hasn't been taken apart in over 80 to 100 years, maybe never taken apart completely since it was uh, assembled. Um, the receiver and the barrel are obviously the parts that have the most uh, buildup of dirt and, and rust, especially the barrel here towards the end or the front, my bad. Um, a lot of surface rust on that. Um, the lower the receiver uh, just has some surface uh, excess buildup of, I don't know what you would call it, dirt and grime, we'll just call it that for now. Um, and the lower, as I mentioned, I kind of get those two screws off. Uh, we will, or I will be removing those probably off camera. As I said, if I can't, it's not gonna affect the bluing, the sanding process too much. It's you're not gonna see these internals um, too much. So not too worried about that. Overall, it wasn't too hard to disassemble. Just some of those screws, obviously, uh, some of them I couldn't remove like this. Um, upper hand guard retaining piece right here. It's got two screws and they're really small and I don't really want to mess with those too much. It's not going to affect the bluing process, kind of like the lower, but um, that's okay for now. Um, 
So there's two ways I could go about this. Um, I think what's going to be easiest is if we do section by section. Um, I said that I like to um, degrease and clean the entire gun uh, first, but I think it might be easiest if we just do it in the sections. Um, and we start with the, um, uh, the screws and some of the smaller parts first and just completely clean those up. Um, I think I'm going to end up doing that over just cleaning the whole gun and we'll um, uh, go from there. But yeah, so we'll clean these up. Uh, not too many. I don't, I think we'd be able to blue them all in, in one step. Um, we'll go ahead. I think the next process after the cleaning is going to be sanding these down. A lot of these look like the bluing's completely removed anyways, so it's not going to take too much. Uh, but yeah, so next step we will clean these screws up um, and get those ready for sanding. All right guys, we're out here in my garage ready to degrease all the parts. I just decided that it would be best just to go ahead and clean everything up um, while we got it all out and taken apart. Um, I think I said before I might just do it in chunks or the sections like do the screws and the smaller parts first and then so forth and so forth. But you know while we're here let's just go ahead and clean everything up. That way we don't have to keep getting everything out again and we can just do it all at once. Um, so but we will start with the smaller parts the screws and whatnot. Um, we will be using I use uh, Hops uh, gun board cleaner that seems to work well. I also got this other stuff which I've been told is really good this copper solvent and then it's some people say yes and no but goof off seems to work really well for anything stronger. I got some of my brushes uh, that we'll use and some cleaning patches. Um, I'll probably speed up a good amount of stuff but we'll start with the screws and the smaller parts. Right, that is all of the screws and smaller parts uh, degreased or well cleaned and we'll do the degreasing in this in a little bit but we're going to finish up cleaning the rest of the gun first. Now we're going to move on to the bigger parts, bigger parts like the butt plate, the trigger, or the trigger parts, barrel bands and swivels and uh, I guess that's part of the bayonet lug and uh, handguard retainer. All right, that is most of the bigger parts done. I think there's a few more left and we'll just move on to those real quick. All right, that is the magazine housing and trigger guard uh, cleaned up. Moving on to the bear on the receiver. We will start with the receiver. All right, that is the receiver cleaned up. Move on to the barrel.
All right, barrel and receiver clean. That is all the parts completely done. Uh, as I said, we will be moving on to the smaller parts like the screws and whatnot, degreasing those and getting those ready for sanding. So I will meet y'all over at the sink where we will be cleaning those screws up and getting those ready for sanding. Uh, as I said, you can just leave all the parts as is after you cleaned them. Uh, we're not gonna degrease these yet because we're not sanding them quite yet. Um, so we will set those aside and move on to the screws. All right, we are back at the main table where we are ready to sand down the screws that we just cleaned and degreased. Here I'm gonna show you uh, the processes that I like to do for sanding. Once again, as we discussed earlier, a lot of people are against sanding down to get rid of bluing and excess rust. But for me, I found it to be the most efficient way of getting rid of all the bluing with the blue and rust remover also as well. And once again, stating that, you know, there's worries about removing markings and stuff like that. I agree, um, but when it comes to the small spark parts like the screws and just doing the whole barrel, there's not too much of a worry about that. When it does come to stuff like the markings, I am a little bit more careful. However, with my guns that I've done in the past and restored, doing the sanding hasn't gotten rid of those markings or worn them down to a significant degree. If the markings were already pretty heavily worn down and there wasn't much left, I would be weary on doing this process. There is other ways of doing, uh, getting rid of the bluing ru and rust completely, but this is what I found to be, as I just said, uh, the easiest way, well, maybe not the easiest, but the best way of getting rid of all of that and giving that nice shiny metal finish. So uh, for this, I will show you all of the sandpapers we will be using. I don't know if this is fully required to do all of these different grits of sandpaper, but uh, I have found that this works best and I do get that nice shiny metal finish. So I have them all laid out here. We have starting with the heaviest grit, the 120, which we start with, then moving down to 220, then 400, 800, 1000, and then 2000. And I don't have it on the table now, but we do finish off with uh, steel wool. But since these are really small parts, there's really no need to do that. You're not gonna notice too much of a difference. I find it most efficient just to go ahead and um, cut those down into smaller pieces and then put them in paper bags or plastic bags. Um, that way I you know, have easy access to all of the different sandpaper types that I want rather than having to strip out each individual piece one by one. So I like to set these aside and bring out the uh, bag of sandpapers that we start with, which would be for now the 120. So we will set these aside. All right keep that bag open, set a couple pieces aside, get our 120. And this is gonna be a very tedious process. I have this bucket over here, or box, that I will put the pieces that I've done in there and then switch back between that and the cup. And yeah, so just start. And the parts that we are gonna sand down are only gonna be the parts that we are actually gonna see or that we are gonna blue. The rest of the screw we're not going to see, so there's really no purpose in, in sanding that down and re-bluing it. With the screws, I find it easiest just to face down and give it a circular motion like so. And it's obviously going to be rough because we're starting with the roughest grade of paper. So that side. And then just keep doing this with all the pieces. When we get to other pieces like this, I should have dumped these all out and uh, chosen which ones I'm actually gonna sand down and which ones I'm not. Uh, for this piece, which is this? This is the, uh, I think this is, the clip latch, uh, which ejects the clip, I believe so. Um, trying to see which parts we're actually gonna see. 
We'll go ahead and sand this top piece down. I believe we do see that outside of the magazine, uh, or the uh, trigger guard and magazine housing. That is the 120 done. Now we will move on to the 220. All right, that is the 220 done. Put our excess sandpaper, sandpaper pieces aside. And we will move on to the 400. All right, that is all the screws and smaller pieces done with the 400. We will now move on to the 800 grit. All right, that's everything done with the 800. Now we will move on to the 1000 grit. All right, that's everything done with the thousand grit. Moving on to our last sanding, which is with the 2000. All right, that is all of the screws completely sanded down and ready for bluing after we obviously degrease again. But um, fairly happy with the way those turned out. They all look good, nice shiny metal finish. I'll give you some close-ups here, I'm sure, of how those turned out. But um, nevertheless, um, it's kind of hard to screw, <laughs> screw up screws, mess up the screws. Um, you really don't see the imperfections as much as say the barrel or the receiver. So there's really not as much precaution needed when doing these smaller parts, especially some of them that you won't see as much, but still good to go ahead and sand everything down to the same bluing process that you would do for all the other parts. For now, that's where we sit with the screws and the smaller parts sanded down and those ready for bluing, and then everything else needs to be sanded. I don't know, as I said, if we're gonna do that next or we're gonna move straight to bluing with these. Stay tuned. All right, guys, we're back at the table. We got the bigger parts with us. We just finished up the screws and the small parts, sanding those down. I went ahead and degreased all of those and set those aside. I've already shown you all how to degrease and all that, and I know that is part of the steps that we had in that big restoration step table um but since we've already or i've already shown you how to do that i'm going to go ahead and skip those parts so i already went ahead and i degreased these you know we went ahead and also you know clean these up with the bore cleaner and the goof off and i ended up obviously just uh degreasing these so these are ready to be sanded down earlier when we were disassembling the gun i told y'all that i had trouble taking some of these screws out i finally got them out i had a vise that really helped um so the magazine lower or the uh, magazine housing slash lower slash trigger guard. There's some million things you can call this. Um, I got all the screws out of here. Uh, same with this. I guess this is the magazine latch. I might put the correct name for it on the screen here, but I got all the screws out for that as well. Degrease and clean that. And I guess the, I forgot to disassemble this part. This is the 
uh, I guess the bayonet lug that attaches to this uh, handguard retainer piece. Uh, is that what this is? <laughs> I don't know. I will probably put a correction on the screen as well if I got that wrong. But yeah, we got a good amount of parts here that we need to sand down. And as I said, we start with the 120 grit, which we have here. Um, I will definitely be fast forwarding this. Uh, this is a lot of parts. It's going to be a very tedious process, so y'all just stay with me. I will probably fast forward in once we get to the 220 and you will see the process. All right, that is all the parts done with the 120 grid. Um, usually the 120 is the hardest sandpaper just because it is the lowest grit we're using and it is a lot harder to um, actually go in there and uh, remove the excess bluing just because of the resistance. But um, I like to do the 120 the most thorough because that's what removes the most of the excess bluing. So it does take longer. Um, it takes a lot of pressure sometimes, um, so that is the hardest uh, part of the sanding is just doing the 120, getting as much as you can off. And it's obviously not going to look perfect, um, you're going to see some scratches on there, but that's why we go down to the lower grits and then we finish off with some really fine uh, sandpaper, that's, that way it's nice and shiny the way we want it before blowing. Anyways, that's that for the 120, we will move on to the 220 and probably fast forward from here. All right, that is all of the parts done with the 220 grit. I should have mentioned before that uh, the reason I do these um, um, sandpaper by sandpaper, like we start with the 120, then the 220, instead of doing piece by piece, is it just makes it easier to organize your sandpaper so you're not having to go in and out, in and out of the bag. Just do them all uh, together with the one sandpaper at a time rather than doing um, piece by piece. I found that that is easiest. Um, also, yeah, um, sorry that I, sometimes I use my leg as leverage to sand down. So if you weren't able to see some of that sanding parts, I apologize. Sometimes it's easier than having to bend over on my couch here and sand down. So using my leg as leverage, uh, sometimes makes it easier on, um, some of the parts. All right. We will go ahead and move on to the 400 grit. The 220 is kind of the last of the the really heavy grit paper that um, helps get rid of the excess blooming and everything up from here, the 400 to the 2000, really helps bring out that shine and gets rid of any of the um, scratches or imperfections that you might see from the 120 and the 220. So everything kind of gets easier from here. You will find that you will be using more of the sandpapers as you go. Like once we get to the 2000, we'll be running through a lot of that. And as you can see, we've already used a good amount of the 220 and the 120. So we'll probably be just using even more with the sandpapers as we go up. All right, let's move on to the 400 grit. All right, that's all the parts done with the 400. Uh, as you can see, we used a lot more 400 than we did the 120 and the 220, uh, but it is easier. You're not really applying as much press pressure. Um, all right, let's see. We will move on to the 800. So I think we are about halfway there. All right, that is the 800 grit done with all the bigger, smaller parts. Um, yeah, 800 is when you actually start to notice uh, the metal start to really shine up. But once we get to the 1000 and the 2000, that's when it really, really starts to shine. Um, 
So yeah, just the thousand and two thousand left. We'll go on and move to the thousand grit. All right, finished with the thousand grit. Only one to go. We got the two thousand grit. And then we will do the steel wool, the zero grade steel wool, um, best we can. Probably only gonna do it with the bigger parts like the um, trigger guard and magazine housing and the butt plate. But some of these other parts we might be able to do, uh, we'll see. But for now, let's move on to the 2000 grit, which is our last uh, sandpaper um, application we're gonna do. All right, that is all of the parts sanded down. We just finished with the 2000 grit, so that will do it. I actually don't have the steel wool with me right now. I'll probably end up doing that off camera, but once we get to the barrel, the receiver, and the bolt, uh, I'll show you all that steel wool process. It's pretty simple, it's nothing crazy. Y'all have done it before. But yeah, you can see how much sandpaper we use. It's a lot. It is a very tedious process, but it is well worth it in the end. All these parts came out very, very shiny almost a mirror-like finish, um, uh, a lot better than I thought it would. Um, just really, really happy with the way that came out. And I can tell that none of the markings um, were worn down in the process. The sight ladder, for example, I'll probably end up throwing a picture. Um, none of those have been sanded down to where you can't see any of the numbers. Uh, they are still completely intact and look just as good as when um, we started off when it uh, wasn't sanded down. So. Um, that also kind of just proves my theory that it doesn't really sand those um, parts down for the most part because what you're doing is actually just removing the uh, previous bluing on there. You're not really actually, you know, um, sanding down metal. You're just getting rid of that uh, previous uh, bluing on there. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and get these um, steel wool down. And I guess the next part that we are going to move on to will be the bolt and once we go from there we'll go onto the barrel and the receiver but for the bolt as i said we are not going to be blowing that we're just going to leave it in that nice shiny metal finish um, and we'll use a metal polisher to finish it off all right see y'all then all right guys well actually i was able to find uh my steel wool i uh, just have a bag full of sandpaper and all that and it was at the bottom uh and side note i actually was able to find somewhat of a sufficient light source um so y'all can see better in here the lighting in this room really isn't that good so i was able to find something i don't know how it'll actually turn out but it does give me at least some better light to to work with so um yeah we'll see how that goes but this is some zero grade steel wool um we'll just evenly apply this to all the parts that we just did and once we're done with that i'm just going to set those aside and we'll degrease and clean those later once uh, we go on to the bluing and then after this I'm just going to go right over to the bolt and do the same sanding process that we did for these but since we're not bluing as I said we're just gonna steel wool and then do some metal polish all right all right that is all the bigger pieces steel wool down and obviously sanded uh, we'll set these aside. Those, the next step for these would be the cleaning and degreasing process before the bluing. But yeah, these came out really, really nice. These will blue up really, really well, especially the butt plate. That was a lot rougher. There's still obviously some scratches and dings in there, but it will turn out really, really well. Along with all the other pieces, the barrel bands came out nice. As I said, there really wasn't much of a previous bluing still on there, but you'll know that it's uh, nice and sanded down and shined up just from that nice mirror-like finish you get from doing all that. All right, we're gonna set these aside and we will move on to the bolt. All right, we got our bolt out here. Um, I am planning to just do the parts that you're obviously gonna see. So things like the actual firing pin itself, we're not gonna see that. I do have a way that we can polish this up though. Um, I can do that probably later, but since we're not going to be seeing it, there's really no point to sanding it down. Also, obviously, the uh, 
firing pin spring itself, and then this little firing uh, pin uh, latch uh, that goes into this bolt head tube. Um, we don't see that piece, so we're not going to be doing that either. I mean, you can do them if you will, if you like, but you know, for me, there's really no point if you're not going to see it. You can, uh, you know, obviously polish it up so in, and lubricate it so um, it runs smoother. But since we're not going to see it, and it really doesn't matter if it is polished down or not, if it's not an integral part to the operation of the way the bolt turns and whatnot, there's really no need to do that. Uh, for this bolt head itself, sorry about that, guys. Uh, going back, so yeah, the bolt head here, if we put it in. The max that we're going to see comes out to about right there. And I can actually see uh, the point of where this, uh, the bolt head and the bolt head tube are sitting inside of the bolt body. Uh, I don't know how well you can see that, but you can see kind of that line there from where this um, actually stays out and has seen, you know, daylight, I guess. Um, so we're only going to sand down to about right there. Um, same goes for this ejector. I believe it goes in like that. It comes out to about right there, I think. So we're only gonna sand down to about right here and just the pieces we're gonna see. I don't worry about doing the inside here. I mean, any of this excess stuff, we're gonna remove with the blue and rust remover. I actually don't think we're gonna actually be needing that going back to the smaller or the bigger parts. Um, we might end up doing it just for the insides. For example, uh, this barrel band. The inside here, we might use some blue and rust remover just so we can end up blueing that and get rid of anything else in there. Um, but um, I don't really plan on doing anything on the surface itself. I don't really see any excess bluing. So um, I don't know if we are gonna actually have to go back and sand this down again, because as I said, that blue and rust remover does leave somewhat of a film. So that's why I kind of don't like using it unless I have to, because having to go back, obviously, see, I saw how long it takes to do the sanding process. Um, I want to avoid that if I can, but uh, we'll get to that. We'll see. Uh, but for now, um, we will be doing the full blue and rust remover on all of the bolt pieces, except for um, the firing pin, the firing pin spring and that firing uh, pins um, latch, I guess. Like with all the other parts, we start off with our 120 grit. And this is where people will say, oh, you don't want to do that because you're going to be um, hurting some of the grooves in which the bolt travels. Yes, but I am going to be avoiding those for the most part. Um, and once you do get this nice and sanded down and nice and polished, it will run better. I mean, you don't want to mess with the sear, obviously. Um, you don't want to sand that down because that's actually integral to the, to the trigger and, and the way that the gun actually fires. But for everything else, it's fine to do it. I've had success on all of my other guns, the Mausers, the Carcanos, the Enfields. It hasn't actually um, affected the way the bolt actually operates or fires. So I don't really have any worries about doing this. And if for some reason it does mess up, these aren't too expensive to replace. And I'm sure I could find uh, one that's in better condition than this. But since this came with the gun itself, we're going to do it. Let's set that aside. All right, as I said, there's really no particular way in doing this. We'll just start from the small pieces up. So um, I like to say the bolt body for last just to see how we get along. But let's get started. All right, that is all the parts done with the 120 grit. Um, it came out pretty good just for the 120. I can definitely tell a difference with that. Obviously, it's going to be a lot more scratched up because it's our roughest sand paper grit type we use. Um, but obviously, as we move forward to the different uh, sand paper types, it gets uh, shinier and shinier and the scratches end up going away. All right, let's do the 220. All right, that is the 220 done. Next, we will be moving on to the 400. This is when we should start noticing somewhat of a shinier finish. The 120 and the 220 are definitely the roughest and the 400 and up is when I actually start to notice somewhat of a difference. All righty, let's get to it. All 
All right, that is the 400 grit done. We're about halfway there. Next, we will move on to the 800 and we'll start really seeing this thing shine up. It, yeah, my bad. I think I said previously that the 400 is when you start to notice shine. The 800 seems to be that really initial, like, oh, now it's starting to get really shiny. So uh, yeah, halfway there, let's get to it. All right, that is the 800 grit done. We are now moving on to the 1000, and then after that, the 2000. So we are almost there. Starting to get nice and shiny, the way we like it. This thing will really come out with the 1000 and the 2000, and then when we steel wool and then polish, this thing will look great. All right, let's get to it. All right, that is the 1000 grit done on the bolt. Got one more remaining, we got the 2000. And after, as I said, we will uh, steel wool and then use some metal polisher. Let's get to it. All right, that is the bolt completely sanded down. We just finished the 2000 grit. As you can see, this came out very, very shiny, especially the bolt handle, bolt knob, I guess, itself. Almost a mirror-like finish on that. I didn't do the underside of the bolt body, as I said. We're not gonna really see that part, but everything else came out really, really well. There's still some splotches on here, but once we degrease it, it'll look really good. But we're gonna go on to steel wooling and then doing the metal polishing, or using some of the metal polish on here. All right, let's get to it. All right, now it is time for us to do the last step, which is using our metal polish. This is Flitz polish. It works really, really well. I've used it on pretty much all of my previous guns, especially when it comes to the bolts. Gives it that nice, final, shiny finish that we like. All righty, let's get to it. All right, that is the bolt all polished up and you can see what a difference that makes. That bolt handle is shiny and the bolt body itself, that makes a huge difference. Uh, obviously we wanna lubricate it and do all that, but I will put it back together for now so y'all can see what the uh, final product looks like. Sorry about that guys. I actually had to go look up a YouTube video on how to reassemble this thing. It is somewhat tricky. I'm pretty new to straight pull bolts, so I tried to wing it and it didn't go so well, but I just wanted to show y'all what it looks like all put back together. Obviously we will take this down again and lubricate it before actually putting it back into the rifle, but I just wanted to see for now what it looks like uh, all put back together. I am really, really happy with the way it turned out. I forgot to mention I am not using blue and rust remover on this. There really wasn't any excess uh, bluing on here that needed removing. Maybe a little bit here back on the cocking piece but um, overall, I'm just happy with the way it came out and there's no need to really go back and do that and then having to re-sand again. So um, obviously the barrel and the receiver are completely stripped down, but you can still put the bolt in and just to see how it looks. I mean, we're really not gonna be able to tell since the receiver isn't blued yet, but we can just see for now what the bolt looks like in there with its nice shiny finish. Yeah, that looks great. Really, really happy with the way this turned out. Now, I couldn't tell when I first got it if the bolt was in fact blued or if it was just buildup of residue over time. All the pictures of the N95s that I've seen at least, the, all the bolts are this nice shiny metal finish. Uh, so I prefer that. I almost prefer that with all my guns. If there was um, variants that did have the nice shiny bolt finish, 
uh, unlike, let's say, the Lee Enfields, those really never had those, so the previous ones I had to do, I just ended up having to blue those. But if I can, I just like to do the nice shiny bolt finish. It just kind of stands out, gives it that nice, clean, new look to it. Um, so yeah, I really, really like it. Um, wasn't too hard, actually. I'd say this is one of the easier ones. There's really not many hard grooves that you have to sand down in here. Uh, unlike, you know, let's say a Mauser, um, that's a little bit more difficult, but this one was relatively easy. So um, yeah, we'll take this back out. Set that aside. And the next thing we're gonna move on to is the barrel and the receiver, sanding this down and getting it ready for bluing. Um, I'm actually, in the past, I have done them all in, well, in chunks where I do the receiver, I sand that down first in the barrel. But like all the other parts, I think I might just do the whole thing with each sandpaper one at a time where we just do, you know, 120 and do all of it and then move on. Uh, that way we can, you know, don't have to keep going back and forth with all the different sandpapers and get in again and again. So uh, this thing is degrease and ready for sanding. So we will get on to that. See y'all in a bit. All right, guys, we're back. We have the barrel and receiver that we are gonna go ahead and sand down. We have it fully stripped and degreased as previously mentioned. Uh, I think I said that I like doing the receiver first than the barrel, but previously I stated too that I think this time around, I'm just gonna try and do this all at once with the same sand sandpaper that we will be using, the 120 grit that we're starting off with. That way we don't have to keep switching back and forth between sandpapers. Uh, this will be a long process. It is late here, so I don't know how much I will uh, end up doing today, but I'm just gonna do as much as I can um, before I hit the sack. So um, we will just start off doing the receiver with the 120 and then moving to the barrel with the 120. So I don't know how well y'all can see this, but the top of the receiver is, uh, almost all the bluing is gone, but the bottom of the receiver, which doesn't see any kind of the environment or whatever, just cause it's covered with the stock, still has its original bluing on there. I do like to still take that down. Um, that way it's evenly matched. It's just kind of weird if you don't do that. Even if you don't see it, it just comes out a little bit weird. It'd be different if it's like a screw or, or something because that's actually you know in the wood and you're not really gonna see it. But if you do end up taking this off, it'll look just kind of weird. It's like, oh, that's not original. Even though it's not, you want it to just look as original as possible. Um, the degreasing process, we were able to get most of the surface rust off, but there's still some on here on the barrel, uh, but that will come off fairly easy. Uh, yeah, so I went ahead and degreased this too, so we are ready to go. The inside of the receiver here, uh, I do do some sanding in there. I don't really do the bore because we polish the bore. Um, you don't have to really worry too much about sanding in here if you're gonna hurt the operation of the gun because we end up doing a fine uh, 2000 grit on there. Well, you know, we move up the chain, but it actually ends up helping, I found on most guns and it does not affect the operation. Um, but yeah, anyways, let's get started. All right, that is the receiver in the barrel done with the 120. I did make sure on some of the parts or the markings on the receiver to not really scrub too heavy on those, especially since most of the bluing has been removed or has worn off already. Um, like the main marking up here, the Steyr N95, I'm not scrubbing too hard off there. I'll probably get in there a little bit deeper once we get to the finer grit stuff. And then some other markings on here as well. I believe the barrel or the acceptance date is what they call it on here. It was already relatively worn down. I can barely see it. I think it says 16 on there. I'll throw a picture up here so you can see. Um, and then obviously the serial number itself, just kind of finally going over that. They're, most of the bluing, as I said, has been worn off, so I'm not scrubbing too hard, but in areas where the pitting or very, very mild pitting is, I'm scrubbing a little bit harder. And then the barrel, since we're not gonna see it when the wood's covered up, I go pretty heavily on that. The only part of the barrel that you really see is this end piece here. Um, and I do give that a good scrub as well. 
Um, but yeah, so far so good. Uh, moving on to the 220. Alrighty, that is the 220 grit done. Uh, you probably saw my arms are getting a little bit sweaty. Uh, man, when you're doing the whole receiver and barrel and you're applying as much pressure as, you, as I am to this, uh, you can build up a little bit of a sweat. But it should get a little bit easier from here. We are now moving on to 400. Uh, so after that, we'll be about halfway there. All right, that is the 400 grit done. We will now move on to the 800 grit and then the 1000 and the 2000. So we are halfway there. And then obviously steel wooling when we're done as well. But for the most part, sandpaper, we are halfway there. Alrighty, that is the 800 grit sandpaper done for the barrel and the receiver. Uh, two sandpapers left, 1,000 and 2,000. So this 1,000, we should definitely see a difference. This is when it really starts to shine up. And then obviously the 2,000 is when it really comes out. And since we're balloon, we're not gonna be using the metal polisher like we did on the bolt. Um, we're just gonna end up just degreasing this after uh, using some steel wool. So we're gonna go from there. Alrighty, moving on. 1000 grit. All right, that is the 1000 grit done. As you can see, well, I don't know how well y'all can tell, but it is really starting to shine up nice, especially the barrel. Uh, quite a before and after compared to all that rust that was uh, originally on there. So that's coming out really nice. Uh, the receiver's doing pretty well. Um, there is a minor pitting, I guess what you call it, on, on top of this receiver. I'm not trying to wear that down too much just because of the marking. As I said, it's not that big of an issue um, that I found in the past, but this will still uh, blew up nicely. Most of that pitting, it's going to be hard to get out, but uh, we will see what the 2000 does. I expect that it will be much shinier once we're done with that. And then we'll have the steel wool and we will be done. All right, let's get to it. All right, that is the 2000 grit done and uh, completely done with sanding of the barrel, the receiver, and all the parts. Yay, finally. Um, yeah, it is a very tedious process, as I've probably said 100 times by now, but well worth it in the end. Um, all we got left is to steel wool. But from what y'all can see, this is pretty nice and shiny, especially the barrel. Quite a transformation. I'll probably throw some pictures up here so y'all can really see the difference. Markings on there are still good. I don't know how well you can see. Um, nothing's really worn down on there. Still some minor pitting on there, but no biggie. Uh, once we blew it, it'll hide most of that up. Um, so yeah, we'll get the steel wool and go from there. All right, we just finished steel wooling. That is it for the barrel and the receiver. We will go on to cleaning and degreasing this again, getting that ready for the bluing process. But yeah, that completes all of the parts, sanding them down, uh, getting them ready for the bluing. Um, it is quite a long process, but well worth it in the end, as I've mentioned. Um, I'll probably throw all the parts back up here just so you can see all that we have done. And I will actually probably show you all the sandpaper we've gone through. 
I'll probably have people comment that you don't actually have to do all of those different sandpapers. You can just do, you know, 220, then 800, then 2000. But there's no harm in doing them step by step like I do. I have gotten this nice shiny metal finish doing that process. Um, yeah, it is a lot of work, but um, every gun that I've done has come out very, very nice. And um, it is quite rewarding when once you uh, get the final product. So uh, yeah, I'll get all the other parts out and we'll show you just kind of everything combined and then just kind of all the sandpaper we've used. All right, I got all the parts laid out. Uh, just doing a recap, we started with the screws, sanding those down and then moved on to these bigger uh, pieces like the butt plate, the lower, the uh, trigger guard and magazine housing, uh, the sight, the barrel bands, um, all of that. Um, that was a tedious process. And then we did the bolt obviously, and you can see how well that came out, especially after we did the metal polish on it. Um, and then uh, as we just did the barrel and the receiver. So yeah, that is all the parts sanded down, nice and uh, shinied up. Um, all of these are ready for bluing, and as I've said, we are going to do it kind of the same way we did a sanding in the steps, where we do the smallest parts first, the screws and whatnot, the bigger parts, uh, and then we're leaving the bolt out, as I've said, and then we finish with the barrel and the receiver. Um, and then once we're done with that, we'll move on to do refinishing the stock. Um, I'll probably do that while I'm uh, doing the bluing process, um, since you got to let some of it sit and dry but I'll throw all that video in the section after the bluing. So yeah, if you made it this far, uh, appreciate it. This has uh, been a quite a fun restoration. Um, a lot of time and work put into it, but once we see the finished result, I know it'll be well worth it. So, oh yeah, I'll uh, go ahead and show you all the sandpaper that we've used. All right, well, here is all the sandpaper that we've used on all of the metal parts and uh, it is a lot more than I thought it was. Um, and you look at this and I kind of ask the same question. It's like, oh, is that all really necessary? Uh, but as I've said, to get the success and the perfection that I like out of my guns, this has been the best way of doing it. There are other ways of doing it, but as I said, it really doesn't get all of that excess bluing off and gives you that nice shiny finish. Um, but yeah, when you look at it, it is quite a lot. A lot of time put in, a lot of just scraping and putting in a lot of man hours, but um, well worth it. And for every gun that I've done this with, I, you know, all the time I've put in, it's just when they, you get the final product, I look at it and I'm just like, yeah, I'm happy I did that. So, um, yeah, well, uh, next we will be going on to the bluing and we'll start with the screws. Um, it's pretty late here, so I will be moving on to that tomorrow. See you guys then. All right, guys. Well, we are over here at my little sink where we are gonna start the bluing process for all of the screws that we sanded down earlier. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of screws actually here, um, but I think this nice metal pan will work for heating up if I just kind of put them in this corner. There are the smaller screws that I'm worried might either go down the drain um, and whatnot. So I'm probably gonna blue these second. Just gonna keep them in that cup. So just to recap, we have our cleaner and degreaser here. I just used some regular hand soap and some of this crud cutter, just a little bit of a mixture of both. Seems to work well. We are gonna start with the super blue. As I've said before, super blue seems to get the, the bluing application uh, evenly on the first few coats. It doesn't really give me that dark color. I don't know why, as I've said, I'm probably not gonna keep saying that over and over, but just know for now, we're gonna start with the super blue, probably do two applications of that, and then do the perma blue and probably two applications of that. Since these are the screws, they for some reason seem to get darker quicker than um, say the bigger parts like the magazine housing and the trigger guard. So first thing we're gonna do is go ahead and thoroughly degrease these again, wipe them down, and then we'll heat them up and do our first application. All right. All 
All right, we just got all the screws degreased and washed them off with some water and wiped them down. They are ready for their first application of bluing with the super blue. What we're gonna do is go ahead and heat all these parts up. I like to use a hair dryer. That seems to work best for me. Also wanted to mention this tray that we're using, these um, brown rust looking markings. That's actually from previous bluing applications. It's not gonna cause any harm to it. But in between bluing applications, I like to get just a, um, an old towel or something and wipe any excess bluing off from there uh, before we put parts back in there. And once we're done with the bluing and we wash off, I put them on this little microfiber towel so we're not spreading any water or anything like that. But um, yeah, we still have these other screws, which I'm gonna save for later. Um, they're not gonna need much, but um, I think it'd be easiest if we just do this in sections. I like to use this little cotton swab. That seems to work best. And as I said, we're only going to be bluing the parts that we're actually seeing, like the tops of the screws here. We're not doing the actual screw body itself. Um, same thing just with like this uh, magazine latch, I guess, or ejector. Um, we're just gonna do this top piece, only the parts we're gonna see. Um, but yeah, these are the smaller parts. Let's get to it. All right, we are ready for our second application of super blue. We'll go ahead and heat these up again and get that on. All right, we're gonna go ahead and heat these parts up and apply our first application of perma blue, but overall this would be our third application. All right, all those parts are degreased and we just got one more application of the permanent blue and we'll be done. And we'll move on to these next, these really, really small screws. All right, those are completely done. I'm actually gonna go ahead and lubricate these. That's why I got this little separate uh, tray top. Um, I like to go ahead and lubricate right after the bling process. That's the way there's no rust buildup or anything like that. So we're just gonna go ahead and do that. All right, that is all the parts lubricated and oiled down. The oil really seems to bring out that darker color that we like. It really, really makes the difference, as you can see. Happy with the way these turned out. I'm gonna set these aside back in their plastic bag and we'll do these small screws. I don't know if I'll throw that in this video or not, but uh, just know that we are gonna do this. All right, guys, we're back at the sink. I decided I'm actually gonna do these bigger parts inside since it is brutally hot out here in Texas. So um, I think this will be adequate for now. Uh, just kind of like we did with the screws, we're gonna go ahead and degrease all the parts. I'm planning to do about four applications of the super blue and four of the perma. We'll see how two to three comes out with the super blue. If it's not getting any darker after the third, we'll move on to the perma blue, but we'll just go from there. I'm gonna try and heat all of this stuff up and do it all at once. As I said, for me at least, um, leaving the bluing on there more than a minute hasn't hurt it. I know the, in the directions it says don't do that, but I haven't seen any flaw in doing that because you can just get it out with the steel wool and from the cleaning and degreasing. So yeah, let's go ahead and get these degreased and we'll get ready for the bluing. All right, that is all the parts degreased. I think I forgot to mention, well, I might've mentioned in my previous video that when you do your first uh, degreasing application, do it very thoroughly. I do about three times over. I'll clean it once, wash it off, clean it again, wash it off, 
and then clean it again just to make sure we get everything off of there for our first bluing application. Uh, all right, we will now heat up these parts and do our first application of super blue. All right, we got it all degreased. It is a tedious process. I've been using that word a lot. Um, but first application looks pretty good. I think we'll probably do two more of the super blues. We'll see what it looks like after the third, and then we will move on to the perma blue. But for now, let's get these heated up and ready for blowing. All right, that's all the parts uh, degreased after the second application of the super glue. We're gonna do a third application. We're gonna see how dark it gets, and if I don't, really don't notice much of a difference, we'll just stay there. If not, we'll go with a fourth application. All right. All right, that is everything degreased and we're now ready to do our perma blue. I think we'll probably do about three to four applications. We'll just see how dark we can get it. Uh, probably four, but we'll see. But anyways, let's heat it up and get ready. All right, that's all the parts degreased. Uh, I think it looks a little bit darker. Usually the first perma blue, you're not gonna to see too much. That's why we end up doing four of those, but uh, definitely a little bit better after the super blue. So we'll go ahead and heat these up and do the second application of the perma. All right, that is the second application of the perma blue done. I definitely noticed a difference on that. There is just a little bit of, um, uh, what do you want to call it, metal look on this side of the trigger guard magazine housing. The other side looks pretty good though. Sometimes that'll happen where it just doesn't fully get in there, but that's why we do more and more applications. But everything else is coming out really, really well. I'm happy, and of course, when we put the uh, lubricant oil on there, it really darkens it up and makes it look nice. So we'll go ahead and heat this up and put the third application of the perma glue on. All right, that's all the parts degreased uh, with the third application of the perma blue. This will be our last one. The only piece that I wasn't really able to get was the sight ladder adjustment button. Um, I don't know how well you can see, but there's a little bit of kind of that metal shiny finish right there. I might just end up re-sanding this down and doing it uh, in conjunction with the uh, barrel and the receiver, but everything else came out pretty well so far. There is a little bit of that shiny metal finish on this lower bit. The other side looks pretty good, but um, we'll see once we lubricate it, how well it comes out. If I need to redo it, I'll redo it. But usually when we put the oil on it, it uh, darkens up and you really can't tell the difference. So, all right, let's do the last one. All right, well, I just decided that we can just uh, go ahead and oil slash lubricate these down right here. This is hopefully gonna make these a lot darker. All right, that is all the parts, bigger parts that we did. Oiled down, relatively happy with the way it came out. The barrel bands especially. The only thing I said was this uh, sight ladder adjustment there is a uh, portion here that didn't really get blue too well. I think I'm probably gonna re-sand this and redo it when I'm doing the barrel and the receiver. This lower here, there's a 
a splotch there, as I just mentioned, but I think once it's all put together, you're not gonna notice it too much. But if I do, I can always redo it, but everything else came out really, really well. So, um, so yeah, that's it for the bigger parts, all blue and lubricated. Next, we will move on to the barrel and receiver and do the same things that we did for this, but we're gonna be going outside for that since this sink's a little too small for it and I got that big sink outside and a uh, bigger work area to do that. So I'll see y'all over there. All right, guys, well, sorry about this. I'm actually gonna end up doing the gluing of the barrel and the receiver here at night because it is just so hot during the day here in Texas. Um, so yeah, the lighting is not best. You probably won't be able to see too much of like when I'm actually putting the bluing on just how well it is applying, but I'll try and just at least put it up to the camera after each application. Um, so I actually went ahead and already did the blue and rust remover. I forgot to record it, um, but uh, step one, as I said, we're just gonna go ahead and clean and degrease this. Um, and we like to start with, as I said, the super blue. I did the uh, VZ12-33 last time and I did five applications of the super blue um, and then four of the perma and it came out really, really well. I'll throw you a picture up here, you can see. Um, so yeah, I think we'll try and do that same thing. We'll see if it's does just as good, but for now we'll just go ahead and put on the first application of super blue after we go ahead and degrease this and heat it up with the hairdryer. All right, we just got it degreased and we are ready to go ahead and heat it up. Uh, the heating up process, I don't know if you saw from the previous video, it does take a little bit, but uh, well worth it in the end. And we are applying the super blue first, doing four or five applications of that. And then for the perma, I probably said that a million times by now, but perma hurts to reinforce. All right, let's heat this up and repeat. Uh, all right, anyways, we'll heat this up, get the third application of the super blue on and go from there. All right, we're going on to the fourth application of the super blue. We'll do one more after this and then move on to the perma blue. Let's go ahead and heat this up and get that on. All right, that's the fourth application done. We're just gonna do one more. I'm starting to notice that the uh, super's not really doing as much anymore, but we'll do a fifth and then move on to the perma. All right, you can see the super blue just helps it spread really evenly. It's not that dark, it's still somewhat shiny, but the perma is what really helps it get that nice final dark coat application whatever <laughs> that we like. Alrighty, moving on to the perma blue. We're gonna do five applications of this. Same process, heat up, apply application, rinse off. Uh, steel wool, just a little bit, just on the first couple, and degrease, wipe off, repeat. Alrighty get on to our second coat of the perma blue. Go ahead and heat it up. Alrighty, last application guys. Sorry, that rack there just keeps falling over with the towel, so I just set it over there. It got really annoying.
Alrighty, final application of the permablue done. Just gonna rinse it off, dry it off, take it inside, lubricate it, and we'll really be able to see how dark it got. I, it's so hard to tell with this light, but we'll see in there. If we need to keep doing cuts, it's, we can do it, um, but we'll, we'll go from there. Alrighty. All right, guys, we're back out in my garage where we just finished bluing the barrel and the receiver. It's hard to tell now, but uh, I'm hoping that when we get this oil on there, it will darken up significantly. There is just a little bit of excess bluing and a little bit of rust on there, but that stuff comes out pretty easily. Once we go and we clean the bar and all that, I'll make sure to get all that excess stuff off of there. But uh, I know it looks bad, but it's really not. It comes off really easy, but we're just going to go ahead and down, get this uh, oiled up and see how she comes out. Alrighty guys, well, that is the barrel and the receiver all nice and oiled down and lubricated. As I was hoping, the uh, oil and lubricant really made this uh, a lot darker the way we like it it looks excellent i'm really happy with the way this came out i already went ahead and well the stock that we have is um already finished i mean i'm not going to give you all a sneak preview now because that's going to be coming in the next video but i was doing that in conjunction with the barrel and the receiver and i went ahead just plop this in there see what it looks like it looks excellent guys i cannot wait for y'all to see it um so let's see what do we have next uh, obviously, we're going to get on to the stock next. That's going to be the next part of the video. But from just a time standpoint, if y'all want to know where I'm at with this, I'm pretty much done for the most part. Uh, I just need to uh, put the uh, polycritic stain on the stock. And then obviously, we're going to end up doing the um, um, polishing of the bore and the barrel. I'll save that for last. I might throw in this video, I might not, or I might just do that as a whole separate video in general since this video is going to be super long. I'm, I'll probably just end up doing that as a separate video, but um, y'all will at least get to see the full reassembly, all the before and after pictures, and um, yeah, this has just been an excellent, excellent restoration. I'm super happy with the way this came out, especially the, the before on that. It was pretty much chrome-like finish to it very very little bluing this came out really really nice so i can't wait to see the final thing uh but yeah stay tuned y'all got the stock stuff next uh just a heads up um there is a few portions i forgot to um film properly um we did some wood filler i talked about um that i didn't end up videoing and I didn't video um, all of the sanding parts. Well, I did, but my grandpa was out here helping me and I was talking to him a bunch. So y'all just see some portions of it, but I obviously have all the steps that y'all can follow. It's, there's nothing crazy that y'all y'all missed with that, but just a, a heads up with that. Um, I mentioned it at the end too, but just, um, just going forward with that. Alrighty, anyways, I guess the next thing, it will be the stock, and then after that, we will be putting this all together. See y'all then. Alright guys, we're outside with our stock. Um, this is going to be the first step with the stock, which is going to be uh, degreasing using some crud cutter and a little bit of goof off and some steel wool just to get the excess dirt and grime off before we use the wood stripper. Um, I might end up washing this down with some water, may not. Sometimes I uh, find that it helps open up the pores, I guess you want to call, in the, the wood and allows that stripper to get in there a little bit better. We got our strippers over here. I'm going to end up using this one, but this is another one I have as well that works pretty good. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but we're just going to go ahead and degrease this and get most of this excess dirt and grime off.
All right, that is the stock gun itself. Got a good amount of that uh, dirt and grime off of it. Um, but as I said, the stripper is really gonna be what gets that stain out of there and any excess dirt and grime. Uh, we'll just do this upper hand guard. All right, the stock and the upper hand guard are degreased. Already got a good amount of that dirt and grime off, as I said. Um, next, we will be moving on to uh, degreasing this over uh, the sink with some water. Um, I find that that helps this wood swell up a little bit, opens up the pores, as I said, and helps that stripper get in there to get that uh, deep stain out. I don't know if that is the actual proper method. I find that works best for me probably going to be some people saying you shouldn't do that but as I said this is how I do things and I'm just showing y'all that all right I'll meet y'all over there Alrighty, we just degreased the stock and as I said what I like to do is run this under some water with some soap and a little bit of crud cutter uh, I found at least that this helps open up the pores in the wood it helps it swell up a little bit and that allows us to uh, get that stripper on there and it allows it to penetrate deeper and get uh, any of the excess stain out of there. So we'll go ahead and do that. All right, that's the upper hand guard degreased and washed off with water. You can see the stock looks like almost all the same was already pulled off, but that's just it swelling up. So this will make it easier for the stripper to get in there and remove all the excess stain. So we'll move over there and we'll get that done. All right, guys, we got our wood stripper. We're just gonna go ahead and apply an even coat on the stock in the upper hand guard. Uh, obviously use gloves with this because this stuff will um, burn you. Well, not burn you, but it is uh, not pleasant to have on your skin and obviously wear uh, protective goggles. All right, we're gonna let that sit for about two to three hours and we'll come off and scrape all that excess away. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, I think step three, down with the stock. And then after this, we will degrease again um, and then get ready for sanding. Alrighty, see y'all then. All right, it's been about three hours since we applied that stripper onto the stock and the upper hand guard. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and scrape off all the excess. I also like to use paper towels to go ahead and wipe down all the excess. All right, we got everything scraped off for the most part. I know it doesn't look uh, perfect, but once we get over and we degrease it and um, get some goof off and some of the crud cutter on here and get it under water and seal wool, it'll, uh, it'll really make a difference and all the rest of this um, stripper will come off. So we'll move over there. All right, guys, we just got the excess stripper taken off of the stock. Uh, sorry, my, my grandpa, he likes to help out with uh, my, some of my gun work so if you see him just know that's who he is um, he's uh, been a great role model in my life and he's helped out with a lot of my guns and he's probably the one who uh, you know gained my interest in all this so uh, anyways um, I probably wasn't able to show you all too well or give you directions on how to do or remove the stripper but you just kind of scrape it down as you can see 
it's not great, but you just want to get most of the excess off. But once we um, get this water going and get the crud cutter and the goof off, all the rest will, uh, will come off. So uh, we're just going to use some steel wool and the crud cutter and the goof off and just scrape away and wash off with water. All right, the upper hand guard is degreased. Uh, as I said, the next process for the stock will be the sanding. And then do the pre-stain. And then the uh, actual stain itself. And then a uh, clear thing of polycrylic. All right, see y'all then. All right, guys, we are back out in my garage where we are going to start sanding down the stock. We just finished degreasing this thing after the uh, wood stripper. And as you can see, almost all of the stain is gone. It looks really, really good. I have some plans on this. As you can see, there is this uh, chunk near the uh, back of the receiver that has been replaced or repaired. Um, I do have some wood filler, and I think what I might do is I'm just going to start sanding this down, see how much that actually, uh, you know, comes out to where it's uh, nice and even with the rest of the stock. But if not, I'm thinking I might just kind of open this up a little bit and get some wood filler in before we do the uh, actual staining. Uh, the rest of the gun, there's really not any dings. I think there's a couple up here that I might put a little bit of wood filler in. But for the most part, this is pretty good. We are going to start just like we do with the metal parts. We're gonna start with our heaviest grit, which is the 120. And we're gonna go 120 up to 220, 400, and then finish with 800 and some steel wool just to give it a nice smooth finish. So I like to start from the buttstock up to the front and uh, do the other side and then do the bottom and the top and then obviously the hand guard. All right guys, we just did the 120 on the stock. That is the heaviest grit we do. So far so good, everything looks relatively good. There's um, still some bumps in here that I'm thinking we will end up doing some wood filler on. Um, but we'll see as we keep going up on the sandpaper, so we'll move on to the 220. Alright, that is the stock done with the 220 grit. We're now going to move on to the 400. And then after that, do the 800 and a little bit of steel wool. And then we'll go on to the filling. Um, we'll figure that out on later, but for now, we'll just finish the sanding bit. All right, that is the sock with the 400 done. As I said, the upper hand guard here my grandpa already did and it's already got the 800 on it and it's really nice and smooth and he steel wooled it so we're just going to do the 800 on here and steel wool it as well and sorry about the ac running in here it's off right now if y'all couldn't really hear me too well um, these garages in texas get quite hot so this thing is a blessing all right and that is the sanding complete I will just do a little bit of steel boiling just to finish it off and as I said from there we'll go on and look at the wood filler and what parts we need to do for that. I haven't really done it much but I'm going to experiment with this gun. As I said, you know, it's a trial and error process. Um, so if it works, great. If it doesn't, no biggie. I'll know that it doesn't work too well. <laughs>
All right, and that is the sanding process complete. This thing now has a nice, smooth finish to it. Really, really happy with the way this came out. You can see the wood grain a lot better. Obviously, there are still some dings and marks on here, which are really, really hard to get out. There's sometimes not a fix to that. Next step, we'll go on to the wood filler. I'm gonna try and figure all that out before I actually start recording, but I will see y'all then. All right, guys, sorry, I forgot to film this part, but we did actually put in the wood filler on some of these parts, or some of these uh, dents and whatnot. Uh, we did one here, here, some on the end of the buttstock here, and also that portion that was somewhat cut out down here. Uh, we just applied the uh, pre-stain, so we're letting that sit, and then we are going to uh, put on our first application of stain. We are doing a mixture. Um, we're doing 70% gunstock, 20% natural, and 10% uh, red mahogany. I think we tried that out on a, a piece of wood, and we're just trying to most accurately um, get the same finish that the original M95 Styres had. Um, I'll throw a picture up here you can see of what an original one looks like. So. Uh, I think it'll come out somewhat close. If it doesn't, I like the color that it, it did come out on the piece of wood we had. So we'll just let this pre-stain uh, finish drying and we'll apply our first coat. All right, we just got the pre-stain on. Uh, all we need to do is just kind of wipe this dry and then we are gonna apply our first uh, finish coat. All right, guys, that is it. First stain on, and I absolutely love the color. I will throw up a picture of what I was after and what we have here. I just love that kind of slight red wood look to it, um, just kind of that orange color. Um, a lot of the M95s I saw have that kind of color to it. The, um, uh, what you call it, the fillings that we did. This thing didn't come out too bad. I don't know if I would do them again. They're not too noticeable, but I mean, it does give it a little bit of a smoother surface. Um, not too shabby, but probably next time just leave it be. Either way, I'm still happy with the way it came out. As I said, this thing is a trial and error type situation. You don't know till you try it. Um, so, but still happy I did it. Just to say, I know I won't end up liking it too much, but I actually, I mean, it's smooth. I wonder if there's a way I can um, um, give it a little bit of a remedy, give it a little bit of a darker color. I don't think it would be too hard. I'm just gonna go ahead and match this hand guard up with it, see how it looks. Pretty good. All right, we're gonna let that dry. Um, we, I don't know if we'll do a second coat, we might. Um, I'll just uh, check it in the morning, see how it is. Um, but usually if after the first coat, if I like the way it is, I don't put on a second coat. You can, but you know, in the end, we're just going to end up putting that protective poly uh, acrylic uh, stain on there um, just to finish it off. And if one coat's enough and then putting that poly acrylic on, then it's fine. You don't need to mess with it because as of right now, this looks pretty darn good. Um, but yeah, we'll check it out in the morning. Alrighty guys, that about does it. We are all finished up with all the work that needed to be done. I wanna apologize, I didn't get to film the polyacrylic application to the stock. My phone died and I thought it was recording, but I guess not. Um, but yeah, everything is done. We've, obviously we started with all the screws, um, sanding those down, and then sanding down all the bigger parts sanding down the bolt and then the barrel and the receiver. And then obviously we started bluing. Same order with the screws, the bigger parts. We didn't do the bolt, of course, we just polished that up and then bluing the barrel and the receiver. And then we moved on to doing the stock. 
where we degrease and strip that and then oh sand that down and then we stained it we preconditioned stained it i think i ended up doing about two to three applications it really looks great it has that nice red mahogany look that the m95 stars kind of have that i've seen but i just love the the color of that that came out excellent and then we finished up by polishing the bore in the barrel and that was an extremely tedious process as well it was disgusting probably the worst i've seen out of all my guns but nevertheless i was able to get most of it out it looks much better i probably showed you all some before and after pictures but really really happy with the way that came out the next step, uh, as I previously mentioned, when we're going over the full sheet of the restoration steps, is we are going to wipe down all the excess lubricant that we've had on all of these parts. And then we are going to lightly uh, oil down the parts again, and then we are going to reassemble, and then we are done. So overall, this has been probably the longest restoration I've done, mostly because I've been having to film all of it. The previous one we did with the Mauser, VZ12-33, I didn't film all of it. I only filmed the bluing of the barrel and the receiver, but um, since I'm so new to the YouTube and the, you know, shooting the videos and having all of that, um, I'm extra careful. Well, I at least tried, I, I did miss a few things, but there's just so much involved. I think I have got over about 20 hours of footage I have to uh, go through and condense, so, <laughs> but, um, I mean, I'll get to that, so I don't know when this YouTube video will come out. Um, but I think I started this, um, what was it, Monday, and it is now Friday. We're all wrapped up, mostly working through the nights. Um, any breaks I have, I try and get some work in, but it's about a, yeah, four-day process. But overall, total man hours, it's about 18 to 20 hours. So it took quite a while, but um, I really wanted to get this one right just from looking at everything it all looks excellent so i cannot wait to get this reassembled but we're just going to go ahead and oil everything down again the bolts previously that we did i put it all back together but i'm going to disassemble this and oil all the parts inside before we do that i'm going to go ahead and set the stock aside and go ahead and take down this bolt and oil it up. Sorry, the reassembly for this still gets a little confusing, but I was able to do it without having to go back to YouTube, so. Uh, all right, well, that is the bolt all oiled down. I'm going to start with the screws, just kind of wiping any of the excess off lubricant, if there is any, and do everything else. Just wipe it all off and then we're going to apply a thin coat of oil back on it. All right, that is the bigger parts wiped down and re-oiled. We'll just move on to the barrel and the receiver. I already oiled up the receiver pretty good, but maybe we'll touch it up just a little. All right guys, that is the barrel and the receiver all oiled up. All that's left to do is reassemble this thing. I've never reassembled an M95 Steyr before. Um, so I might just wing this. There might be a point I have to go look at some YouTube videos again to see how it's all done, especially given how many screws and little parts we have. Um, but I think for the most part, I'll just speed up this portion of the video. I won't really do much talking, but just so y'all can see the thing being put back together. Um, but all right, I'll see y'all on the other side.
And there we have it, guys. All put back together. I'm sorry if um, I was skipping a bunch of the uh, assembly process. I had to actually go over and look to see how some of this went back together. Um, especially the lower here with the uh, magazine spring and all that. And um, the trigger too. Just a little tricky. I had to do some banging around with some of these screws. When you redo the stock sometimes you can get some um, of the finish inside where these screws go and it made it difficult to get those in there. But yeah, this thing's all put back together and it is gorgeous. I am so happy with the way this came out. This is, yeah, probably the most hours I've ever put in to a restoration, but it is well worth it, as you can see. Just really, really happy with it. I always tell myself, is it worth it after putting all that time in, the sanding, the bluing, just how much it takes. And every time I get done, I'm just like, yep, it was worth it. So I'll uh, throw up some pictures, obviously, so you can see, because um, the lighting in here isn't excellent. But yeah, it is a beauty. Really happy with the way the stock came out. I know a lot of these uh, M95s, they have somewhat of a, um, of a uh, clear coat a um, little bit of a shiny coat on there, I forget what you call that. Um, is it satin? No, I forget. I'm not even gonna try and correct myself here. I'll probably throw it up here and a picture of what they usually look like. But for me at least, I, I kind of like just the um, the flat look to, uh, to woods on these stocks. Um, a lot of my restorations, I don't put a, um, a I guess it is a clear coat, um, a semi-gloss, that's what it is. I guess semi-gloss coat on this. I just like the kind of the bare wood look to it. And it looks great. <sighs> yeah, I mean, after all these hours put in, it's just like, you know, you become very personally attached to it. I mean, this is definitely a looker. I mean, just from the beginning, I mean, we'll show at this point just all the before and after pictures where we started. It's been quite a fun restoration. I mean, I'm blown away how well this came out. I was worried that the receiver, especially, just how worn down it was. Well, with all the excess blue and gone, if we would really be able to get in there and get it nice and blued, and we did. The bolt looks great. <sighs> Runs smooth. Really, really happy with it. And all the work we did with the barrel and the bore, too. I know if I ever shoot it, that it'll be well worth it as well. Um, I know the ammo, as I said, is really hard to come by, um, the, since this is the, uh, original caliber it came, came in, or the gun was produced, the 8x50R, um, and most of them got converted over to the 8x56. Um, sorry if I'm <laughs> putting my words together, it's a little tough right now, it's, it's late here, uh, I've spent a lot of time trying to reassemble this thing and get it all wrapped up tonight so I could do a video on it, um. I was just eager to see the way this thing came out. And yeah, I'm glad I, I, I did it tonight because I'm just so happy with it. So anyways, um, yeah, thank y'all again. This has been really, really fun. Um, really just uh, thrilled with the way um, a lot of these have been coming out and just really happy that I've uh, grown a little bit of a fan base. Um, as I said, I don't really plan on this getting uh, too big or too popular. I, there's just um, a few of y'all, especially that have um, been asking about updates on this and what I have coming forward. And I really like that personal connection. I get to talk to y'all about this kind of stuff and get y'all's insight on, you know, um, various guns that'd be cool to restore and um, different processes and all that. So, but anyways, um, that'll do it for this video. Um, I will keep y'all updated on my Instagram. I believe, as I said, the next gun we're gonna be restoring is the P14 Enfield. That'll probably be coming next week because I'm gonna need a lot of time to do the video on this. But um, as I said again, appreciate y'all um, for your support and watching this video. I'll see you next time, Surplus Restoration.